Hello out there in cyber accounting land. It's Professor Ebit here to help you master it quick. In this session, we'll look at the accounting for fixed assets and also for depreciation. We'll cover the costs that are included in the fixed asset cost, three different methods to calculate depreciation expense, why we do depreciation, and then finally, what happens when we get rid of the asset later on. We might sell it or junk it or trade it in, and you'll see that event can cause there to be a gain or a loss in certain cases. First, the cost of the fixed asset. When we buy an asset, of course, we put it into the asset account because we're not going to use it up right away. It's going to be around to help us generate revenue in the case of a fixed asset, equipment, trucks, things like that. So we put it into the asset account because we're expecting to use it for a period of years. Now that period of time that we expect to use it for is referred to as the estimated useful life. And we'll see in some of the methods of depreciating, that'll be expressed in years. In other methods, it'll be expressed in what are called output units, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. The cost that's included in a fixed asset will include all the costs that are necessary to get the asset in place and ready for its intended use. So things like sales tax, uh, if you buy a truck, you'll pay sales tax, dealer prep charges, taxes and tags, that'll all be added into the delivery truck or commercial vehicle that you're buying. If it's a building, of course, it'll be the cost of the building, but will also include the settlement charges that are paid by the purchaser which will usually include, in some cases, they'll include some of the transfer tax. They might include broker's commissions if we hired a realtor to find us a certain location. All those settlement charges that we pay to get the building ready for intended use would be added into the building cost. In the case of a piece of land, not that we're going to depreciate land. Land is the only fixed asset that you don't depreciate. But the acquisition costs of the land will include cost to get the land ready for its intended use. If we bought a piece of land and we intended to build a building on it, and right now it had a swamp, and we had to drain a swamp, that cost would be added to the land cost. Same goes for if we buy a piece of land that has an old building on it, and we don't intend to use it to build a building, we're going to use it as a parking lot maybe, so we've got to take the old building down, the cost of taking the old building down would be added on to the land cost. Equipment it would include installation charges, sometimes calibration to, to get it ready to produce the units that it produces the first time. Thereafter, it would be regarded as maintenance expense when you had somebody come in and recalibrate the machine. So in short, it's all the costs that are necessary to get the asset in place and ready for its intended use. Now, why did we buy the asset? To help us generate revenue. So. Depreciation is the act of taking the asset's cost and allocating it to the different periods of time when we believe it will be available to help us generate revenue. Now, it's an estimate. Nobody really knows. Now, can we revise the estimate of the useful life? Sure. In accounting, you can revise an estimate whenever it's appropriate to do so. And generally speaking, if we extend the useful life, the depreciation expense will be less. If we reduce the useful life, the depreciation expense will be more. The same kind of a thing happens with an intangible asset, as we'll see a little later on. Probably the most commonly seen depreciation method is called straight line depreciation. The formula is shown here. To get this amount of depreciation expense for a given period, what we want to do is take the cost of the asset, which included all the installation and everything, and then subtract what's called a salvage value. Salvage value is sometimes called residual value, and what it is is the amount that you believe you could get when it comes time to junk the asset at the end of its useful life. So in other words, because of the scrap metal value that it has. So usually it's not very big. Uh, some kinds of assets may not even have a scrap value. A computer, for example. There isn't very much you can get when you junk a computer. So if you were depreciating a computer, you probably wouldn't use a salvage value. But a vehicle, very possibly, sure. 
If it's an automobile, you might be able to get three or four hundred dollars for the scrap value when it's junked. If it's a truck, maybe several thousand dollars. So again, it's an estimate which can be revised if you so choose. Now, we take that out and we're working with the resulting amount, the cost minus the salvage or residual value if you think there is one, and we're allocating it to the number of years in the estimated useful life. So if you had something that you thought would last 10 years, you just take that top number, divide by 10, and the result is a year's worth of depreciation. Okay, so there are two things we need to be careful of on the straight line method. One is the initial year may not be 12 months long. Suppose we bought the asset and started using it on the 1st of July, we'd only have six months in the first year. So once we get that amount, we may have to prorate it for the first year and also the final year. If we scrap the asset on September the 30th, we used it for nine months that year instead of 12. So we may have to adjust the first and last years. But all the intervening years in between will be 12 months long, so once you work the amount out, you can use it again and again. Straight line is very easy to do, uh, lends itself well to things that are used in a linear pattern. A parking lot, a fence, a building, tables and chairs. Do they wear out more in one year than another? Not so much. So it's kind of the same across the board. But what about a truck? Would you use a truck more when you're busier and less when you're not as busy? Very possibly. If you're in a construction industry, all of your heavy equipment, bulldozers, steamrollers, cranes, things like that, would you be using them more when you're building more and less when you're building less? Absolutely. So if you've got assets where the pattern of use varies, this method, units of output, is made to accommodate that. You see the top is just like straight line, costs minus salvage or residual, but in the denominator, instead of dividing by years, we're dividing by the number of output units that we believe is in the useful life of the asset. Now, things that are very commonly used for vehicles, output units could be miles. So if we had a truck, we might estimate 200,000 miles maybe of useful life in the truck, take the top number and divide by 200,000 miles and you have depreciation per mile. To see how much it is for a given year, all we have to do is multiply by the number of miles that the truck was driven delivering things. This is what they do with fleets of rental cars. If you've ever rented a car, they're always looking at the miles in, miles out, they're seeing the number of miles used. They're going to depreciate their whole fleet of cars very, very similar way to this. They'll get the depreciation per mile on one car, multiplied by the number of miles the fleet was driven, and there you have the depreciation for the year. Aircraft, the output units could be hours. Heavy equipment, the output units could be hours. Uh, machinery, sometimes they're units that it produces. So you can accommodate fluctuating pattern of use very easily with the units of output method. The second good thing about it is the fractional period issue disappears. We don't care how many months we used it, all we care is how many output units there were in a given year. Some assets are either used up at a very, very quick pace or they become obsolete very, very soon. In those cases, GAP allows us accelerated methods if we want to use them. Two very, very commonly seen accelerated methods are the double or 200% declining balance method and also 150% declining balance, which is very similar except at the point where you're getting the rate, which is what I'm going to show you now. If you're using double declining balance, the first step is to get your declining balance rate, which is done by taking uh, one and dividing it by the number of years in the useful life. So this is illustrated with a four-year asset life. So one-fourth is 0.25, and then when we double it, the factor would be 0.5. If it were a 10-year asset, 1 over 10 would be 0.2. When we double it, the factor is 0.4, so on down the line. In the case of 150% declining balance method, the only thing different is at this point, instead of doubling it, you'd multiply by 1.5. Now, the purpose of these methods 
is to depreciate most of the assets uh, value in the first couple of years because we're not going to have it for the entire useful life. Why? We're going to either use it up or it's going to become obsolete and we don't want it anymore. So who might use this? Uh, we might use it for technological equipment maybe because it becomes obsolete very quickly. Uh, if we operated a cab company and we offered 24-7 service, you know those cabs are not going to last seven to five years as a car is supposed to last. They're probably going to last us two or three years. So we would want to use an accelerated method to get maximum depreciation while we still had them. The idea behind doing an accelerated method uh, is primarily for book purposes, which is what we're talking about here. On the tax return, we are restricted to only two methods that we can use. The IRS will let you have something like this, which is called MAKERS. M-A-C-R-S stands for Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System. Comes from a chart. You look up what type of asset it is, and then the chart tells you how much depreciation it takes each year. And it's very similar to this. It'll give you more in the earlier life of the asset and less later on. The other thing that's allowed on a tax return is straight line without any residual value. That's the only options we have. But on the books, we can put whatever method we think accurately reflects the pattern of use of the asset. Now, the other thing about this accelerated method is we're back to being concerned about the length of the first year. If the first year is 12 months long, we would take that factor, multiply by the cost of the asset. You don't take the uh, residual value out in the beginning like we did on the other two. This one's different. So we take the cost, multiply by the factor, and that would be year one. So if, you, if we do that and it comes up $50,000, let's say, and we started the asset on July 1st, we'd have to chop the $50,000 in half and only use $25,000 in the first year. Probably the easiest way to show this is to construct a table showing the depreciation for each year for a $100,000 four-year asset placed into service on January 1st, 2015. In the first illustration, let us suppose the asset has no salvage value. On the chart, you can see the left-hand side is the years of use, 2015 through 2018. Now remember, beginning book value is the same as cost in this method. We don't take the residual value out. All right, the rate was 0.5. Remember, 1 over 4 gave us 0.25. When we double it, it's 0.5. Now notice the rate stays the same. It's not the rate that declines. It's the book value. You'll see. All right, so the depreciation expense for the first year is the book value of 100,000 times 0.5, or 50,000. Accumulated depreciation on day one was zero, so it goes from zero up to 50,000. So the ending book value is 100,000 minus 50, or 50,000. Remember, book value is the cost minus the accumulated depreciation. So the book value for year one becomes the opening book value for year two. Once again, we take half, so 25,000 of depreciation for the second year. So accumulated depreciation is up to 75,000 by the end of the second year, which means the book value is down to 25,000. It repeats for the third year, and at the end of the third year, you see the accumulated depreciation is up to 87,5, and book value is 12,005. Now notice how we're not applying the factor in the last year. The reason is because the last year is a force to make the accumulated depreciation become equal to the amount that we want it to be. Now in this case, there is no salvage, so we want the accumulated depreciation to be the same as cost. So what we're going to do is put in depreciation expense such that the 87.5 that we had at the end of year three goes up to 100 at the end of year four. So that amount is 12,005. And you can see the ending book value is zero. The ending book value is zero because the asset had no salvage value. See how much depreciation this method takes in the first year? It's taken fully half of the asset's cost in the first year. It's taken three quarters of it by the end of the second year. Cumulative depreciation is up to 75,000 by then. If that's not aggressive, I don't know what is. Notice also how the final year is a force number to make the accumulated depreciation come to 100,000 as we mentioned. Remember, book value is always cost minus accumulated depreciation. 
Now, let's look at the same situation, but this time, let's suppose the salvage value is 2,000. So you see the chart, the first three years are the same as they were in the other chart. The only thing different is the final year, again, we come to that force. Now remember, we want the accumulated depreciation end up being 98,000, so that the ending book value will be two. So how much do we put in for 2018? We put in enough depreciation expense to make the accumulated depreciation go from 87.5 up to 98,000, and that's 10,005. So the ending book value will be $2,000, the same as the salvage value. Remember, we never want to depreciate the asset below its salvage or residual value. We always want to stop when the book value becomes equal to the salvage or residual. If the salvage value is zero, we do take it all the way down so that the accumulated depreciation is equal to the cost. In the previous chart that we were looking at, if the first year was not 12 months, the chart would operate the same way. We just would have to shorten up the first year so we'd have different book values coming into each of the following years. But we would still force the final year so that the book value came out being equal to the salvage. Another accelerated method that I actually see in day-to-day -day accounting practice is called some of the year's digits. And it's actually very, very simple. With a three-year asset, what you would do is take literally the sum of the years. Three plus two plus one is six. So in this asset, if you were using this technique, you would use three-sixths of the asset for depreciation in the first year, two-sixths in the second year, and one-sixth in the third year. Another point that I wanted to cover talking about fixed asset accounting is in situations where companies have many, many assets coming and going all the time, car rental company, for example, it's going to be a real pain in the neck to keep track of all of the fractional years. So if you don't want to keep track of fractional years, there is a technique that accommodates that. It's called the mid-year convention. Under the mid-year convention, regardless of what method we're using, we assume a half a year of depreciation in the first year of the asset's useful life and the final half in the last year. Now, regardless of when we began to use the asset, if we're under mid-year convention, we take a half year if we brought the asset in on January 1st or if we brought it in on December 29th, we would still take a half year the first year and the other half year in the final year to avoid having to keep track of when they started and stopped. In accounting for fixed assets, it's important for us to keep in mind the difference between a regular repair and something that will lengthen the life of the asset. Repairs will be a current period expense because they keep the asset in working condition. So oil changes, state inspection, things like that, if the battery wears out, putting another battery into the car or truck, those are all repairs. An extraordinary repair is like an overhaul. If we took our truck at the end of seven years and took a look at it and said, this truck needs some work, but the rest of the truck is in pretty good condition. At that point, we might decide to do an overhaul and put in a rebuilt engine, rebuilt transmission, replace the suspension parts, put another set of tires on there, and now you've got a truck that you can drive maybe another six or seven years. An extraordinary repair will lengthen the life of the asset. So now I've taken a seven-year truck, put some repairs into it, and now I can lengthen it out to 13 or 14 years. So that's the distinction. A regular repair keeps it in operating shape and it's an expense. An extraordinary repair lengthens the asset's life. There are three ways that we might dispose of an asset. One way is we might junk it and maybe get a little bit of money from the junkyard. Or if it's in good enough condition to sell and a market exists for it, we might be able to sell it and get more cash. Or we might trade it in towards another asset. We're going to look at all three of those situations now. First, let's look at what happens if we junk a vehicle that we bought back on the 1st of January 2007 and paid $20,000 to get. 
At 1231.14, the end of last year, the accumulated depreciation was up to $17,500 at that point. In other words, all from 2007 up until then, we had made entries depreciating each year. We debited depreciation expense, credited accumulated depreciation, such that the balance was $17,500 on that day. That's the day we junk it. All right, so we junk it and we get $500 for the metal in the truck. Now, here's the beginnings of recording that event. We're taking away the truck cost from our accounts because we're getting rid of the truck. Now, if you think about how that got in there when we bought it, we debited trucks. Now that we're getting rid of it, we're crediting trucks. So that's why that's on the credit side. Also, we have to get rid of the accumulated depreciation that the truck had for the same reason. We don't have it anymore. So if you think about how that got there, in the previous years, as we said, the company was debiting depreciation expense and crediting accumulated depreciation and built it up to 17.5. Now that we don't have the truck, we have to get rid of it, which is why we're debiting it for 17.5. Okay, now we put in the fact that we're getting 500 bucks from the junkyard, so we're debiting cash for $500. Now, look at the amounts. You got $18,000 on the debit side of that entry and $20,000 on the credit side. So the entry doesn't balance. The reason why it doesn't balance is we have to put one more part in. The part that we're putting in is the loss on disposal. $2,000. Okay, why is it a loss? Here's why. Remember, book value is cost less accumulated depreciation. So this truck had a book value of $2,500 still left in it. The cost was $20,000, accumulated depreciation was $17,500, so that left a book value of $2,500. We exchanged an asset that had a book value of $2,500, and we received $500 in the exchange. That's why there's a loss. So now you have 18 plus 2 is $20,000. We have $20,000 on either side, and the entry balances. Now, let's suppose that the truck, instead of having a junket, it was in good enough condition that we could sell it and a market existed for those kinds of trucks. So, same set of facts with respect to the cost and how much accumulated depreciation there was, but now we sell it and we get $5,000. All right, so this is still present in our entry. We're taking the cost of the old truck out. This is still present in our entry because we're taking away the accumulated depreciation that it used to have. Now we're getting cash from the person who's buying the truck from us for $5,000. Okay, now check your money. You got $22,500 on the debit side. You got $20,000 on the credit side. The entry doesn't balance. You know what it's missing? It's missing the gain on sale. $2,500. How do we know it was a gain? Okay, back to the book value. Remember, cost minus accumulated depreciation. Cost was 20, accumulated depreciation 17.5, so the book value was $2,500. We exchanged an asset that had a book value of $2,500, and we received $5,000. So we received more than the book value. That's why there was a gain. Now let's look at the case of where Instead of junking the truck or selling the truck, we decide to trade the truck in on a new truck, which we might do. Now, here's the relevant information. Cost, still $20,000, purchased way back in 07. Accumulated depreciation, still seventeen five. We go to the dealer and the truck we want has a $30,000 sticker price and the dealer is going to give us a trade-in allowance of $2,000. Now, if you've ever traded a car, a trade-in allowance is how much they're knocking off the sticker price in exchange for our old vehicle. So in this case, they're going to knock $2,000 off if we give them the old truck. Now, we're going to pay $5,000 cash and then finance the rest with a note. Multiple things to record, but 
always start with the beginnings of it. We're taking the old truck away, so we're crediting out trucks as we did before. We're taking away the accumulated depreciation that the old truck had. We don't have it anymore, so we debit it out as we did before. We're putting 5000 bucks into the deal, so we're writing out a check to the dealer for $5,000, so that's to credit the cash over there. Now, let's finish our entry so that it will balance on both sides. Okay, so let's look at what we're doing. $30,000, they're going to knock off two, so we got to take care of twenty-eight. We put $5,000 towards it. That means we need a note for twenty-three. Note payable. So that's us taking out a truck note to pay for the rest of the balance. Okay, now, let's get a handle on what we, ex what we got during this exchange and what we gave up. Back to the book value, this is why it is so important that the accumulated depreciation be up to date on the date you're doing this to be able to get the book value correct. The book value is sometimes called the basis, and it's the be all and end all in an asset exchange. It's got to be correct. All right, so accumulated depreciation, 17.5, cost was 20,000, so book value is 2,500. Now, when we do a trade in, what we're getting is the trade in allowance. The dealer is giving us $2,000 trade in allowance for an asset that we had a $2,500 book value in. There's a loss on this trade, 500 bucks. All right, so what do we got now? We got $18,000 on this side. We have $48,000 on this side. We have to debit something for $30,000. That's our new truck. In this set of facts, the new truck will go in at the full $30,000. We experienced a $500 loss on the trade because the trade in allowance was $2,000, which was $500 less than the book value of what we traded in. Now let's look at the case where the trade in allowance is larger than the book value of what we're trading in. You might be thinking, ah, this is going to produce a gain. The answer to that question is maybe. When we get to the end of this illustration here, I'll show you what the difference is. Okay, same set of facts with respect to the cost, 20,000, accumulated depreciation, still 17,5. Doing it on 1231.14. Now, this time the dealer gives us $3,000 because we got up and left a couple of times and he said, oh, well, let me go ask my boss. And then he increased it up to 3,000. Okay, now, he is knocking 3,000 off a $30,000 sticker price truck. So we got to handle 27. We're putting $5,000 down still, but now our notes only got to be 22,000 instead of 23. All right, so we're financing 22, putting 5,000 in, so we're taking care of the other $27,000 towards the purchase of the truck. Now, let's get a handle on what happened on the exchange. Book value, 2,500. Cost is 20 minus accumulated depreciation is 17.5. This time, we're receiving $500 more. Now, here's where you have to look at what is being traded. In this case, it's the same kind of asset. We're trading a truck, we're getting a truck. In cases where they are similar assets, if there's a gain on the trade, rather than showing a gain, we reduce the basis of the new asset. That 500 bucks is going to reduce our new truck down to 29.5. Now let's check our money and see if it's straightened out. On the credit side, we got 47,000. On the debit side, we now have 47000 so the entry works. So if it were a trade of dissimilar assets, if we traded in that truck and we got a car instead, or we traded in that truck and we got 
furniture instead, something like that, you'd show the gain. But if it's the same kind of an asset, any gain on the trade reduces the basis of the new asset. So the reason for that is because the accounting principle that's involved is called substance over form. We traded a truck and we received a truck. We should not be showing a gain because of a transaction like that. But if we traded a truck and received a different asset in exchange, we would. So if there's a loss on a trade, we always show the loss. If there's a gain on the trade, we have to stop and look what's being traded. If it's the same kind of an asset, we do as we did here. If they're different assets, go ahead and show your gain. Finally, let's consider the case of a long-term asset that doesn't have a tangible form. Is there such a thing? And the answer is sure. What about a distribution license? We buy a distribution license, make us exclusive distributor of some kind of a product for a certain amount of time in a certain geographical area. Is that a valuable thing? Sure. It lets us be the only source for that product for some period of time. So we would consider that a type of an intangible asset. Same goes for a copyright. If we took out a copyright on a, a saying or a picture or something like that as part of our advertising and somebody else wanted to use it, they'd have to pay us a royalty for its use. So that copyright would be an intangible asset that we would keep in that category for the length of time that we thought we would derive income from it. The same is true of a patent. If we take out a patent on how to make something, same thing. If somebody else wants to use that patent, they have to pay us a royalty for its use. So those are the types of assets that you'll find in that category. And as we said, they lack a physical form, but when we allocate their costs to the periods that they will benefit the company, the process of doing that, rather than calling it depreciation, it's referred to as amortization. So they take the cost of it, allocate it to the number of years, and instead of using an accumulated depreciation account, we just reduce the intangible asset directly. So let's say we paid $20,000 to get the patent on how to make something, and we thought we'd use it for 20 years. All right, make it easy for me, 20,000 divided by 20 years, 1,000 bucks a year. Every year, we would debit amortization expense, and then we would credit the patent account for 1,000 bucks. So it would drop to 19, drop to 18, and at the end of the 20 years, it drops all the way to zero. The reason why that's done is because it is very, very unusual that somebody would trade in a patent or a license or a copyright. But do they trade in trucks and cars? Yes, quite often. So that's why we use accumulated depreciation for the physical form assets, and we don't do it for the intangibles. One final kind is called goodwill. Now, goodwill only happens when we buy another company and we end up paying more than the fair market value of that company's assets. So let's say there's a company we wanted to buy because we wanted to get into the li that line of business and the fastest way to get into that line of business is to buy a company that's already doing it. So we pay $30 million to buy that company and the fair value of its assets are only $27 million. We have $3 million of goodwill. It's addressing those intangible things that make that company worth more. Its reputation, the staff it has, the brand name, any of those kinds of things. So anytime you pay more than the fair market value to buy fixed assets, you'll get goodwill. And that's how that gets there. And it would be amortized over usually a pretty lengthy period of time. So now, You've had a coverage of fixed assets and depreciation that I'm sure will leave you pretty well fixed. This is Professor Eva checking out. See you next time.